This is Marysville as it once was, a beautiful historic town on the way to the Victorian snowfields. This is what it became in just a few hours on Saturday. It's upsetting for all of us. We're, we're a small community and uh, we, we care on each other so much. We can have a lot of funerals to go to, um, bury a lot of friends. Unfortunately, I lost my house. I've lost probably eight friends I knew in Marysville that have died. Do you want to get back there? Marysville? There's nothing left. A town in ashes and a shell-shocked community struggling to come to terms with their huge losses. One of the fellows we know, he, he came down from his house and between his house and the oval, he's seen probably six or seven dead bodies yeah, he thought, sitting on the floor. Yeah. Many of the surviving residents are sheltering here at a relief centre in neighbouring Alexandra. All roads to their town now blocked and the news filtering in is grim. As the flames engulfed Marysville and nearby towns, desperate residents flocked here to the hall of the Alexandra Secondary College, where they sought shelter, food, clothes and comfort from each other. They had horrific stories to tell of the intensity and speed of a fire, the likes of which locals had never seen before. It sounded like I heard a buffalo coming over the hill and I said, get your stuff, the fire's, that's the fire coming up the valley, you could just hear it rumbling. It got ab absolutely got so dark that nobody could see. Everybody had their headlights on. They were evacuating people from the football oval so there was a just a bank up of cars trying to get out of Marysville at that point and the fire was coming over the hill really fast. Stephen Collins is the assistant manager of the Coringa and Marilyn resorts. He was at work as the fire approached and he fled to Alexandra in a hotel van with two other employees and their pet budgie. So this is all you've got? This is my life. I've got my burn cream, <laughs> my woolen socks, and my midi files, my camera, that's it. That's all he had time to grab. While he knows his house and the resorts he managed are now gone, he, like many survivors here, hasn't seen the TV images of the destruction of Marysville. Still, he holds one forlorn hope. Left my cat, so stardust, if you're there, I'm coming for you. Local builder John Thwaites decided he'd try to tough it out and fight to save his house. By the time he realised it was futile, it was too late to leave. I tried to protect the house, but um, the wind was just too heavy and I, um, I just had to jump in the car and go down to the local oval and um, just survive. He and about 60 others huddled together on the oval as the fire roared through. What was going through your mind on that oval? Survive. And you had? I'm still here, yeah. He too ended up at the Alexandra Relief Centre, along with log truck driver Steve Gilfoyle, who decided he and his family would forget about trying to save their house when he saw what had happened to his truck. My truck hasn't burnt, it melted. He's still deeply in shock and finds himself being comforted by his 12-year-old son, Jake. I was going to have one. Yeah, I'm all right, mate. No, I'm just cold. Just nerves. Steve Gilfoyle knows he's lost his house, like so many others here. Now they're just desperate for information about friends, neighbours and family members who may have perished trying to save their homes. At a meeting at the Relief Centre last night, this was the most detail they could get from authorities. There's been some deceased persons located. At this particular point in time, police and the DBI, disaster victim identification teams are in attendance. Um, it may be several days before residents are allowed back into Marysville. While this shocked some at the meeting, others had already been bracing for the worst. Well, we done a count this morning of, of people that uh, that we know have gone 
and we got to 15. But uh, yeah, just that's that's what we know amongst ourselves who who never made it. We we got to 15 this morning, and uh, nobody really wanted to discuss it anymore. Jake, how are you holding up? All right. He's propping me up. Have you got a few mates who might be missing? Um, yeah, one. The two Pretty kids that go to school on the bus, were you? Three. Our little boy this morning told me about his eight-year-old friend from a primary school and his mother, who've perished, that's been confirmed. But out of all of this despair, volunteers are rallying to help. Donations from the public are pouring in and some unlikely friendships are being made. Marilyn Nonsi, who still doesn't even know if her house is still standing, offers accommodation to the homeless resort manager. If we're answering in a few days, <laughs> we've got something standing, you come along. It is a tough time, but I've, you see community come together. You see people work out what is real and what is the essential things in life and how relationships are so important. And um, seeing a whole community pull together is just marvellous. And there was one lucky break in the weather. As night fell, so did the rain. Survivors who'd gathered at a local hotel hoped this might mean an early return to their hometowns. But their hopes were short-lived. By daybreak, Marysville had been declared a crime scene and the roads in and out of town remained blocked. We've got livestock that are dying and I have to go home. I understand that. You're going to let us lose everything as well now? I'm sorry, I have, I have orders. Those stranded here are wondering what happens next. They can't go home, but what do they do and where do they go once this school that sheltered them reopens to students in a few days' time? I don't think it's fully impacted on me yet, the shock. It's still just not knowing what to do and wanting to get back home, but what is home now? It's rubble. It's just ashes there.